Bees and farming. You guys ready? Bees and bees. Okay, it's 11.50. It's a good time. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the Crew Roundtable Podcast, brought to you by CrewRoundtable.com, a roundtable discussion of all the hot news affecting the greater Toronto area, featuring Big V, Marco, Gino, and JR, and now your host of the Crew Roundtable, the champ who runs the camp, Sal Champ. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Crew Roundtable Podcast Edition. On today's, uh, the topic for today's episode, bees and vertical farming. Let me introduce my panel of guests, distinguished guests around me. Big V, welcome. Giggity. Wonderful. Marco, welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. Gino, welcome. Thank you once again, champ, for having us here in your beautiful home. Uh, it's going to be uh, hopefully a educational topic for a lot of people that are listening out there. Uh, I had no idea that this was an issue <coughs> before uh, when we were speaking about it, but uh, how Toronto fits in uh, is going to probably shock some people. Oh, for sure. And JR, welcome to the show. Oh, he ah. earns himself 75 points. Off the door, off the door. That's Lake Wilcox, baby. <laughs> I find, I find Thank the Thank you amount. very much, Sal, for welcoming, welcoming us to your house. Uh, we are a buzz with excitement. Oh, I pleasure find, to have you. I find the amount of 75 points only a little bit insulting towards Lake Wilcox. I think there should be more. Well, if we don't get any sponsorship, then there's going to be point deduction for opening up a can. Uh, we're putting out the putting out the call to sponsors, uh, <laughs> Loganitas. We're looking at you. Um. Okay, so uh, for this episode, we're talking about uh, the bees, um, and some people forget how important the bees are, and uh, we're tying in vertical farming as well. So, um, who wants to start off this discussion, Gino? So th- this was started by the the central question of where are the bees? Mm-hmm. Apparently, there has been a disappearing act done by the bees. Yeah. Globally. Yes. Going on since roughly the mid-2000s, somewhere in and around yeah. there. Maybe, yeah. That's about when they everyone started noticing it, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, what do bees do, and why do we care? Well, um, for most flowering plants, I mean, plants, plants, plants reproduce by uh, having pollen, which is the, the, the male uh, part of the, uh, the plant, being deposited on the, uh, the, st- the stamen, which is the female, female part of the uh, plant, and that they, comp- they combine to produce a... Seeds that are that produce, that, that produce seeds. Mm. Now, you've got you. There's two ways to mate these two parts together. You can be like uh, corn and pine trees, where they just dump a lot of pollen into the air, mm-hmm. and the, the wind blows the wind. them into a, a female tree and pollinates the female tree. It is usually works in large populations is not a it's not a, it's not an efficient method uh it's bi- biologically speaking it's it's energy expensive because you're producing excess pollen because a, a, a large percentage of it is going to get wasted um the second the second option is to uh have this sort of form a symbiotic relationship with an insect and usually that's a bee you know, other pollinating animals are hummingbirds, uh, bats pollinate some plants like bananas. But the primary uh, of you know, butterflies and moths do, the, do it as well. But the, the majority of pollination is done by bees. Uh, not just honey, not as honeybees. The, the, the apis family is very, very large. And... Um, they do the majority of pollination. What happens is 
the symbiotic relationship works like this. The plants produce, pol produce a nectar, and the bees feed on this nectar, and they visit each plant. Now, the bee is, 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 hair, is a hairy insect, and when it touches certain parts of the plant, it picks up pollen. Now, the, the, plant, the, the, the bee now then moves on to another plant, and so if it's the same species of plant, it will, rub, it, it will make contact with the bee's uh, you know, reproductive parts per, and rub the pollinate, pollen on the female parts of the plant, and po thereby pollinating it. Now, the bees do eat some of the pollen as well. It is a source of protein, but the primary benefit is to the plant. And, and this is this is something that's been evolved over over millions of years, and it, it seems to work quite well. The mm -hmm. uh, problem is these plants are now entirely dependent on the uh, on the existence of bees to to reproduce. So threats to uh, any decrease in the bee population has a direct impact on. On plants. Now, you could say, well, who gives a shit about some wildflowers in the middle of nowhere? Well, unfortunately, my friend, a majority of all foods we produce, and most of the vegetables we eat, are pollinated by bees. Um, if you, even if you wanted to, by extension, a lot of the foods that get fed to our meat production ultimately have to be bee pollinated. A lot of hay, alfalfa is a primary feed that's used. That is bee pollinated. You know anything with a fruit, anything any fruiting uh, vegetable that you anything almost anything you buy in, in in the supermarket needs to be pollinated by bees. Beans, tomatoes, almost salad? Every, so, not not, not salad. Uh, not uh, yes, when salad salad that flower if you leave salad in the ground, it flowers. It flowers. Sometimes it, it, by then, if you don't pick it over the next the next the next growing season. It sends up a flower. A Carrots, piece of salad that we eat. Yes, it will flower. It does flower. No, but when when we pick it, it, ha it doesn't reach that point. No, but the, the seed that you plant, you know, there, 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 there's usually two sets of crops. There's a set of crop that is kept for seed, and then there's the sale crop. Because the, otherwise, the, how are you going to create new new, new 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 thing? You can't just pick all the all the, all the salad before it's uh, grow so on. But. You know, even carrots. If you leave a carrot over the winter, it, it will flower the next season. Like so, the the, the amount of f fruit and vegetables that we we eat that's that's insect pollinated is, is staggering. And the upshot of what you're saying is no bees, no food. It's exactly what we're saying. So it sounds like it's a pretty intensive issue. It uh, is. We've had uh, some people here in Toronto. Apparently, Toronto is turning into somewhat of a mecca for beekeepers. Yes, actually. Mm -hmm. I have an article on that here. Um, it's an article in the Toronto Star. It was um, in February of 2016. And it was entitled, um, Toronto could become the first Canadian bee city. Now, whether that happened or not, I didn't further look. But uh, apparently, Toronto was home, for, or is home for about 300 uh, bee species. And the program that they have... Uh, it was it's with very various uh, um, educational institutes and companies, uh, in which, on the roofs of many buildings, they actually have beekeeping. And um, examples being, um, let me just pull it up here. U of T uh, has uh, beekeeping on the top of uh, two of their buildings uh, in uh, Toronto, uh, the Toronto Botanical Garden. On Lawrence, they also have beekeeping in there as well. Downsview Park has beekeeping. They actually, uh, they call it their, um, no, sorry, Fort York also has beekeeping, and they call it uh, their, their um, whatever those boxes, uh, the hives. Hives, hives, the artificial hives. Yeah. Uh, they actually call it the bee, ba bee barracks. <laughs> Um, Those military black, bees. Black, yes. <laughs> They've been trained to kill. The African um, those killer bees that were black, up from black, Mexico. The Black Creek Community Farm has beekeeping. Even the Royal York Hotel on the top of the roof, they have bee, uh, beekeeping uh, there. And apparently the chef actually uh, takes care of it and collects and uh, makes and collects honey that they use in the oh. restaurant in the, in the Royal York. 
they also have a bee, a bee farm at um, the airport uh, in Mississauga and various other places in Toronto. So apparently, obviously, you may note that people have noticed uh, since the 2000s, the population of bees uh, has noticed, noticeably been dropping. And Toronto is basically is trying to be a leader in in trying to rectify that mm-hmm. and providing homes uh, and to help uh, increase the the bee population. Yeah, well, the, the phenomenon that Big V is talking about is is actually referred to as uh, colony collapse disorder. Uh, I believe, as, as I said, in early two thousands, late nineties, uh, beekeepers were noticing that entire colonies were just empty, like the whole box would be dead or gone. And nobody knew what this was causing. It, it was it, it's re, it was really and still is very difficult to diagnose. The problem is being that a lot of the bees didn't die in the hive. They would they abandoned they, the queen. They either abandoned the hive or they died somewhere outside the hive. So it was impossible to do like a bee autopsy, you know, dissect the bees to see what exactly it is was, it was killing them. Um, I think I think there were a couple of studies that did exhaustive searches in the neighboring area to pick up all the dead bees they could it was it's, it was it was a lot and then there's been a lot there's been a cut and it, there's no one reason uh i know there i know there's a, there's a one case is a parasite uh, there's a blood sucking parasite that attaches itself to bees and it's fairly large you know relative to the bee size i've seen pictures of it Relative to the size of the bee, it's like having something the size of a dinner plate on your back, sucking, feeding off of your blood. That's that's the relative size. It's fairly, it's a fairly big. The big causes, uh, the causes that they found though were somewhat local. It wasn't the same thing. It was like it was kind of like a cancer. It's not the same thing every place. No, there but was it a isn't. little thing here that was having those blood sucking things at one point. Some chemical, some place. Yeah, pesticides. It's, 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 it's local, but it's not super local. It's not like different to the block. Because remember. A lot of these beekeepers transport their bees to where they're needed. Um, the, uh, an orchard, for example, will hire a beekeeper to bring his bees to the orchard. No way. And and yeah, to poll- to pollinate the the, plant, the 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 trees. You know, they move them at night because at night all the bees will come back to the hive to sleep. and to sleep. So it's colder. They'll go back and then they. They drive. Or then they'll drive. Then they'll take them back home. But that that's the majority. On, uh, that's the majority of how. The large because there's not enough natural population to deal with the large amount of flowers and mm-hmm. in, in, in that that farming could produces uh, because they need a, a fairly high you need a high high hit rate and the natural bee population just doesn't have just doesn't exist to 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 deal with that kind of intensive uh, pollination so a lot of the beekeepers are beekeepers for hire so you end up you you do end up unfortunately with a bit of a mix where you have you potentially have bees interacting with other bees that may be infected with something, or you know you're you, you're feeding they're feeding off a tree that, that is sprayed with pesticides because you know that's that's pretty common in in the orchard industry, um, and 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 yeah there are there are multiple reasons for this but that those are the two primary reasons uh, you know, pestis, uh, pests and uh, pesticides themselves. There's been extensive. Research on a new and the latest, most common um, uh, insect called insecticide, uh, a family of them called uh, neonicotinoids. Uh, this is a systemic uh, pesticide, meaning that it's it's applied to the seed, and then the plant will intake the will absorb the 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 pesticide uh, after the fact, and it's inside the plant. It's it's inherent to the plant. It doesn't get washed off. Uh, so the the uh, the farmer, the, the benefit to it is that the farmer doesn't have to keep re- keep applying it multiple times. So it does limit the amount of pesticide in the environment. But the thing is, it is retained inside the actual plant. So it's a systemic toxin, uh, and therefore it gets into the nectar of the plant. Now, uh, from the name. It's it clearly it, it it is actually based uh, on neo, uh, on nicotine. It's a nicotine based derivative, and what they found in bees is that it does actually ha- make them behave like smokers. They have this. They they uh, they do get an incentive to feed off of nectar that has neonicotinoids in it, 
because they get the same kind of smoker's high that human smokers get when they when they take a drag. And you're not going to fault the bees for that. <laughs> no, they're they're actually growing the neonicotinoid in the front of their house. That's right. And they bake the they bake the uh, toast it toast it. They toast it, toast in, it in, in, in a the little bee bee toaster oven. Tennessee and sun. And they grind That's it up right. in their little bee. Uh, and then it'll be uh, it's a coffee process. grinders. It's a yes. process in art and a science. Yeah, to, <laughs> if, if you if you want to get this callback, uh, please go back and listen to our marijuana episode, where Gino re- 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 divulges how he was the uh, the tobacco kingpin of high school. The most <laughs> downloaded show on our uh, on our webpage. It was a good quality way. show. Uh, now let's uh, talk a little bit more. Dispel some of these myths about the bees, okay? Uh, because most of what you said about the bee apocalypse, there are some places that propose that point of view, uh, most notably being Greenpeace. And that's where I think a lot of people get this, get this information from. Uh, if you go to the Greenpeace website, uh, they have a picture of a fuzzy little bee in the corner. He's kind of all kind of looking kind of worried. <laughs> and they, have, uh, they go through some information. So they say that, yep, there's been an uh, uh, observed and mysterious sudden disappearance of bees over the past decade, um, which is uh, high rates of decline in the honeybee colonies. For the causes, they say that it's somewhat pesticide-related, the way that you were describing, but they Mm -hmm. say pesticides are the number one cause for the disappearance of the bees. Um, There are some parasites that they mention and climate change. So they say Mm -hmm. that's always uh, contributing to to the bees' disappearance. And their solutions... Uh, ban all bee-harming pesticides, adopt a bee action plan, and promote ecological farming. Sounds like a measured and reasonable approach. But Greenpeace, I think, does a little bit of hyperbole, which I know sounds kind of dumb saying a little bit of hyperbole, but I think that they embellish things quite a bit. I do appreciate that there's an organization like Greenpeace out there doing the work that they're doing, (laughs) <laughs> but they're not the place that I would go to for facts on the matter. Um, I would much rather go to a, a government source such as Stats Canada when it comes to talking about bees and bee populations. And if we look at the numbers, at the raw data, just dealing with Canada here, we're not dealing with the U.S., we're not dealing with Europe, even though those numbers are similar, there is no bee apocalypse. The numbers of bees are actually up in the past five, six, seven years. Pounds of honey, dollars worth of honey. Well, one would argue it's because of the activism that's, that's, that's kind of helped remediate the scenario. Now, this is where, if you go back far enough, you see that there is a, there is a drop, mid-2000s or so, there is an unexplained drop in the bee population. But these programs don't go all the way back to that time. We didn't immediately start noticing, oh, the bees are going away, let's figure out what we're doing. There were a lot of people wearing tinfoil hats that were espousing this position, and said, let's do something about it. Now, of course, the conservation items that are, ha- or the conservation activities that are happening right now, like Big V mentioned, happening in Toronto, <coughs> a lot of people maybe jumped on the bandwagon, but the colony at the top of uh, a, a hotel or something like that, th- these are intensely local uh, activities. We're talking about the global bee population, right? We're talking about bees all across Canada. And now there is... The, the numbers from StatsCan, you got to take them with a particular lens too because they mix together honeybees, bumblebees, wild bees that you can't really measure, right? So they take all of these items and they kind of get that aggregate, which is a place to start. Um, but when you look at those stats, bee populations are not declining. They're actually going up. If there was a bee apocalypse, that's been solved, Right? Um, when it comes to what they do for us in our food supply, this is where I think maybe we should transition over into the vertical farming because vertical farming doesn't use bees. All right. Wrestling podcasts are a dime a dozen these days, but you want a show that you can feel is yours and a show you can react on and react with. Well, asking you shall receive main event madness is now your reaction show as we're live after every pay-per-view at 11 30 p.m eastern blocktalkradio.com slash pro wrestling dot biz and wrestling dash news.net are the places to be as we have new episodes every sunday 
Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Main Event Madness. Madness Unleashed. A pro wrestling dap biz radio network production. Explain. Okay. Vertical farming. These are plants that are grown indoors. Okay. Okay. They're not even grown in soil. Mm -hmm. So these plants are primarily leafy greens. Yeah. That don't require the pollination from the bees. Okay. Okay. There is a company, and the biggest company out there right now is in New Jersey. Yes. I have that same article. Yeah. So what they do is they use LEDs that stand in for the sun. Okay. Instead of growing them in soil, they grow them in cloth. Yeah. And they have them stacked on top of each other, racks and racks and racks. Okay. Right? Uh, the, uh, the company is called Aero Farms. Okay. So they have 12 levels and 70,000 square feet of space where they grow leafy greens and they produce 2 million pounds of food a year. Yep. Okay. Now, these leafy greens, those seeds woven into a mesh cloth, of course, the mesh cloth is made out of recyclable material. The, the plants are stacked right on top of each other. The lamps provide the sun. They get water and nutrients sprayed in a mist directly onto the roots of these plants. <laughs> so this is highly efficient farming. The only problem is it costs a shitload to do. <laughs> well, you, you, you're expending a lot of money to replicate what Mother however, Nature is doing however, for free. However, however, the yield time for many of these crops is anywhere from a half to a third to of a the third, amount yep. of time that they could basically go through a batch of crop that it would take in soil outdoors uh, by traditional farming. So basically, what well, would take about 30 to 40 days outdoors, uh, they could actually have accomplished in 12 to 15 days. So the, the, the high churn rate on the produce, that's a plus? You also, also the other benefit is this is year-round. So in climates that won't allow this, such as ours, or even further north, this is actually beneficial because you can actually pr provide produce to remote or remote areas or areas far more north where the growing season is four months or less, which is actually beneficial to the population because to get, you know, leafy greens, uh, you know, northern Ontario or, or none of it or wherever, uh, you know, it's next to what? Impossible. It, it's, it is. Uh, and there are some and, uh, and provinces. And the thing is, it could be grown there, which means even though it's more expensive to cultivate, you are eliminating a lot of the transportation cost. That's a good point. Now, although, although the, the, the food itself that's being produced does not involve bees, um, these leafy greens have to be reseeded. So... Somewhere along the line, there is a field that is going to be dedicated to solely producing seed to, re to restock these facilities. Right. They and have to get the seeds. Are, the, the bees are, import, are required. So they, this place never mentioned where they got their seeds from or how they keep the process going. Um, there, there might be some... <coughs> Uh, you might not need seeds, right? There might be some vegetative propagation. A lot of these are microgreens. In some of them, yes. A lot but of, at, at, at one point, you do need seed. I mean, you... Yeah, initially. Yeah. A lot of the product that they have is apparently microgreens and herbs. Um, and I don't know what the hell is this different from regular vegetation like salad or whatsoever. Um, a lot of the consumable, a lot of the consumable foods are, are annual plants. Uh, and therefore, they, they, they wouldn't be. I don't know. Like a lot of those aren't aren't like celery. You don't celery is seeded. Seeds. Celery is seeded. Yeah, but you could propagate it otherwise without seeds. And you, right? I don't know. Yeah, you just cut, to cut off a piece of celery, stick it in water, you get roots. Right? You can you can do Splicing. it, but I don't know if that's an if that's a terribly uh, efficient process. Uh, you know, you have to be. You know, you're already babying the plant. You know, you're babying the plant. You, you need you need to get results. Um, they can't spend a whole lot of time, uh, you know, trying to get these re things replicated. It, it, you know, and actually, a lot some a lot of hot house hot house plants actually do have in house bee colonies. 
they I, I was like to, I had to roll with their fair. They actually used bumblebees uh, for internal uh, internal pollen enclosed pollination because they they're a fairly small colony. Uh, they don't get they don't get super big. Bumblebee colonies are not don't get super large. Not like not like the European bumble not, not like European honeybees. So um, you get you get that benefit. From I'm, I'm so thinking that's, where the, that's where the hot house peppers come I'm from. I'm thinking I'm agreeing with Benny on the um, on um, Jr. with this one. Uh, I think uh, here's an example in Toronto, Living Earth Farm. Um, they basically do vertical farming, and they keep mentioning organic seeds uh, is basically what they use to for their products. Uh, I, obviously, I'm thinking. They have to get their seeds from somewhere. It's well not, because they put it into the mesh. Yeah, right? so that's how they get that quick churn rate. Yeah, so I'm gonna have to agree with Benny. I don't. I think vertical farming. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think they 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 don't have a method to produce their own seeds. I think they basically buy the seeds uh, for their. Uh, and for yeah, so it's a reduced. It's a reduced dependency on bees, but it's not bee free. Well, there's ultimately. also and there's also other other drawbacks to it. Um, Luckily, they said that the taste of these greens and microgreens and whatever, they said it tastes fine. Yeah. Well, probably because you're growing them local, you can right? pick them later in the growing process, and therefore, they're more ripened on, uh, in, on the plant. But So I can see that benefit. But the nutritional value might not be there. Oh, really? Because they said that those LED, sunlight. those LED lights are not a 100% replacement for sunlight. for sunlight. And the mesh that they have and, and putting everything directly on the root, it's not a replacement for soil. Yeah, the, the, there's some micronutrients. So these things that. might look nice, mm -hmm. they might taste nice, but like but they haven't diet determined, pop, they haven't determined the nutrient. They haven't determined mm -hmm. the nutrient yet. Right? Value yet. Yeah. And, and, and uh, for those, those who, and, 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 and while we're talking, well, touched on a little bit on the subject for organic farming, the reason why organic farming is not super widespread and, not, and why it's not and why it costs twice as much as other foods is because organic farming doesn't use, A, doesn't use artificial uh, fertilizer and it does not use pesticides. No. Or preservatives. Uh, well, you know, it, yeah, it's true. Right? It, it's part of the, I think that's part of the pesticide effect. But people don't appreciate what kind of loss you get when you don't use pesticides. Like the, the insects can can multiply and pests can multiply at an alarming rate. You can lose entire crops. crops. Yeah, you. There's a high loss rate. There's a very high loss rate in organic farming. Yes, there are certain techniques of planting certain plants next to you, but when you when you're doing it on a large scale, you do get a fairly significant loss amount of loss. And so is this is this how this uh, vertical farming can be a benefit? The vertical farming is beneficial probably because it's enclosed. So, right. but you know, insects because it's because it is open to the environment. Like air has to transpose. They they can still they still have a very a very high risk of pest infestation. True, but obviously this their obviously their 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 crops are monitored. Uh, well, let's put it this way. It's yes, not a, a chance, closed system. It's not a closed oh, system. I understand it's not a closed system. We already system. said that however, they have to bring seeds in. Yes, however... And you're forgetting the power that you have to use to yes, generate. Yes, I understand that. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is because this is all a, such a small area, it's easier for them to actually visually observe and maintain True. the plants over instead of, uh, you know, 22 acres of land uh, that obviously... With the naked eye, it's harder to to like you basically you have to you have to sample each section yeah, to what, see what's going on. But, but once an infestation starts, it starts it goes really fast. Days, In, insects, days, yeah, days, days. Insects reproduce at a high rate, and and and, and it because you know your example of for you know providing food anonymous is probably the best is 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 probably the, a good application. Um, Places like Ontario that have a more a warmer climate and actually have farms, it's probably not as great a, great an idea. But yeah, it's it's actually really a viable. It's a pretty good option for places that could not otherwise produce their own food. It's a very niche. It's a very niche application. And actually, there actually is 
there is actually farming, uh, vertical farming occurring in downtown Toronto. They're actually using abandoned or unused factories and converting them uh, to be to to this process, and they're actually selling their crops locally to hmm. grocery stores or to uh, schools, cafeterias, and so forth, which obviously eliminates the transportation costs, which actually makes it more comparable <coughs> to uh, to what you what's farmed than in and uh, traditional farming uh, uh, and that, is so, that is sold in our stores. So. All right. Yeah. Um, well, let me just say something. Um, You're the champ. You even though this want. is, I know, you know, you know, in Canada, the numbers were going up according to your research, you know, and that's great. <laughs> Not my um, research. Stats Canada. Stats Canada. Well, you. I didn't go count bees. You typing on the keyboard. You should go. I didn't go count bees. You typing on the keyboard and bringing those numbers up. But there's a place in China. I don't know if you guys know this. There's a, a valley in China, and um, uh, there's no bees in this area. But it's they have. The rivers um, run red. They have. Uh, what? The? No, no, that was something what? else. That was something else. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, was the M- that was the M M&M and M factory. They I'm just got- saying the pollution. <laughs> No, oh, no, no. This no, is my way of saying the pollution. Uh, the M- and, uh, in the states, because life is an M M&M factory had a blue dye spill. It was uh. maybe not, 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 it wasn't just the blue dye because you know it's a little sweet. Yeah. So they had the blue ca- sugar dye spilled. Yeah. Because it was sweet, the yeah. bees went right after this, and they started producing, be- and it got into the honey, and all the honey was blue. Oh no way! Yeah, they, it oh. contaminated the honey of the nearby. Uh, Nearby hives, it was, you could tell, you could see it. They, they were, I saw pictures of this. They scraped off a little bit, and the honey was blue because wow. the bees had immediately. So it cool. was a big spill. We're talking like hundreds of thousands of liters of of the of the dye. Did Either it affect the bees though? I don't think so. I don't know. Or was it I don't just know. A I mean, I mean, clearly it was. It was. A, it a, it's, a, it's an edible food item, so I would imagine okay. it didn't have much of an okay, impact. Back, back to your but valley. But it did contaminate there. a lot. Va- of people. Valley of the Dead. Honey. Back That's to the fine. China Valley. Valley of the Dead. So this, in this China Valley, they have these. I think it was pear trees, but it was fruit trees, and um, there was a old. It's there were old people living in there. The farmers, uh, the kids went to the city. They go, so now they're left with these trees, and there's no bees to pollinate them. So what they do is they collect chicken feathers. Yeah. They tie the they tie them together, and then they collect the pollen from the female tree. Uh, yeah. male trees. Yeah, and then they dust yeah. the female they, trees. They dust the trees with the pollen. They do they do that for bananas eh? too. Bananas are manually pollinated yeah. to maximize uh, yield, but normally bats pollinate bananas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, bats. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bats cool. Dr- a, fr- a certain type of uh, bat in the tropics drinks nectar. Okay. And it pollinates the the it drinks the nectar out of the ba- out of the uh, out of the banana flower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gets its mu- the front muzzle being a furry animal. Yeah, it's yeah. covered in uh, in <laughs> pollen, and as it visits each flower, it pollinates the flowers. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, well, you know. <laughs> my, anyways, my point is, it's like, you know, can you imagine areas with no bees and you're stuck pollinating them, pollinating them by hand? It's a terrible amount of, you know? it's a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. And that's to survive. There's yeah. a lot of unemployed people, right? Uh, you know, this is China has yeah, biggest, yeah, yeah. China has this a big enough population. They can project, do it. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Right? Over a billion Chinese, they got to do something, right? Yeah, yeah. enough guys. <laughs> yeah, keep them busy. So, well, that's our discussion on uh, the bees and vertical farming. It was a nice little chat we had on that. Um, so to close it off, we're going to go around the table again. Big V, what are your closing thoughts? I don't know. I guess we need more bees, and I think vertical farming uh, has a future in uh, in uh, areas uh, like in uh, northern Canada. Uh, let's give it a shot. Thank you, Big V. Your point roundup for today is 400. Uh, Mark? I heard Kevin O'Leary was going to... Uh forced down the unemployment rate by calling for a cull of bees. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is big work program. Oh, Lord. Very good. 400 yeah. points for you. the market and honey. Yeah. And honey. For, uh, Ray Liotta honey. Yeah. <laughs> Gino, closing thoughts. Uh, the, um, uh, when it comes to the, to the bee apocalypse, uh, I think it was overstated. Um, some of the conservation ideas that have, or activities that have taken place, I think were good. Um, at least it got the topic 
out there and it got people to recognize the vital role that bees play in the ecosystem. Uh, when it comes to vertical farming, however, um, I don't know if that's going to be a long-term solution or if that's going to feed the masses. To me, I think vertical farming is going to be food for the rich uh, because mm-hmm. it just, um, the amount of inputs that go into that building, we've already shown that it's, it's not self-sustaining like a traditional farm. Uh, you gotta you gotta go get uh, seeds from somewhere. Um, you gotta import all your water. You have to import, especially the power that you use to to uh, have the LEDs, which substitute for the sun. That is free energy. Uh, so it, it might help uh, some of the richer people in society have their microgreens uh, all year round. But I don't know if it's ever gonna get to the point where it's actually uh, feeding the masses with good cheap, nutritious food. Great. Thank you. JR? Um, just last thing, what, you know, some of, some of us might be wondering what they can do. Well, I was just going to um, call you Mr. Uh, bead Feeder. Thank bead you. Yeah. Beekeeper, yes. Uh, there, there's a couple of things you can do. Now, if you're living in a city, it's, it's unlikely that you can keep bees. Um, because bees collect honey, they're very defensive of that. So they, they're, they're, they're very, they're likely to sting. So, um, Keeping bees is not a viable solution for everyone. What you can do is, if you want to, to feed bees, help bees directly, you can buy uh, solitary bee nests. These are not hives. Solitary bees are non-colony bees. They, they don't collect honey, and, and they're pretty much stingerless because they're not defending bees. What they'll do is, they do visit, they're, poll- they're also referred to as pollen bees, where they actually collect pollen, and they put it into these little, these little, um, cells, they lay an egg, they form a, po- a ball of pollen, and over the winter, the, 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 seed, the, the egg develops over the, over the winter, in the spring it hatches and eats the pollen ball and then hatches and becomes a bee. It doesn't form a colony, so there's not sink. Uh, I, I, I personally own one, I bought it from Lee Valley, it works really cool, and you can see the little, little, little cells start to get filled up, it's really cool. Um, if, if you don't want bees at all, you don't want to keep bees at all, what you can do is plant some native plant species. I know Home Depot carries a lot of them. You can buy them online really cheaply. Toronto is a hotbed for native seed stores. If you look, uh, if you do a search, a search on the net, you find at least a, a myriad of them. And, you know, you just sprinkle some natural and uh, some <clears throat> native seeds around and feed the bee, contribute to the bees that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, fl- yeah, just native flowers. Exotic stuff, not as great because they're, they're, they've are they evolved to be symbiotic with a different species of insect, probably not even a bee, uh, you know, probably not even an insect, period. Uh, so stick to native species. You know, maybe you can, you, you can usually mix and match. And uh, that is the perfect way to contribute. If, if every garden had a sprinkling of uh, some native species, the bees uh, would be great. I think like uh, wildflowers. Wildflowers, wildflowers I, you know what? Uh, as much as, uh, you know, the scourge of, of, of lawns everywhere, uh, dandelions are actually a perfect source. Oh, really? Oh, bees, yeah. bees they, 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 they've actually encouraged you not to, you know, try not to mow, your lawn, mow them too quickly. Let the, you know, as much as people, as much as they look unsightly, they are a really good source of nectar for bees. They're, they're food. They are food. They're 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 plentiful. Yeah, flowers and are very moist. No, I mean human food. Like yeah, you, you can, can eat can, those. You can, you eat, can eat the leaves. You they're can eat very the good. They're very nutritious. You can, yellow. you can eat the flowers too, yeah. but even the leaves. Yeah, yeah. Most oh, people the leaves, eat the yeah, leaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very throw, nutritious. You throw those in the vertical. You know, farm. sure they're yeah. a little <laughs> ugly, but remember, dandelions die off within a, within a month or so. So, doing it, you may you probably may as well just spend save your money, and you know not be so neurotic about your about your lawn. And do something good for the a little a little something good for the environment. Perfect. Five hundred points for Gino. Forgot to award them. Uh, Six hundred points uh, for Jr. Thank and, you, Champ. Um, Actually, I have one uh, thing to add on to uh, uh, Breeze's uh, comment there. Is of, it about uh, eating dandelions? No, not eating dandelions. Chicoria. Uh, about the uh, uh, vertical farming uh, to feed the masses. Uh, the actual concept was never to feed the masses. It was actually just. Uh, um, find a more efficient way with regards to a lack of space and being able to deliver produce to areas that it's harder to get. 
that was a whole the concept of the vertical farming. So feeding the masses, that wasn't the purpose of, uh, of, of vertical farming when I read it in the articles. Thank you, Big V. That's it. And uh, that's uh, this week's episode. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to uh, subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and the Stitcher Radio app. And um, you can also find us on Twitter, at Crew Roundtable. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, add the hashtag AskTheCrew. And if you like to buy your shit off Amazon, don't forget to use the links on our website, CrewRoundTable.com. There's two links on the page. If you're from Canada, click on the Shop Amazon Canada link. And if you're from the USA, click on the Shop uh, Amazon USA. You're just trying to screw me using those links. No, as a matter of fact, you don't. The price is not affected. We do get a commission, but it is does not impact the price of the products you buy. Yeah, and any commissions earned is going to upgrade the, stair, uh, the, uh, the microphones and studio here to get some quality uh, quality podcasts out. Do you, mean, do you mean me and Mark will be able to upgrade to a big mic from a small mic? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we're we, going we, we we to have the we, big balls. We pour all contributions <laughs> back into the show because that's just the show we are. <laughs> exactly. we we, we got to tweet a picture of those mics. Balls, Thanks Mark. for joining big us balls. and have a great day.